All right. Well, it's June 29th. Sharif Yunus here with Dr. Kevin Majors, and we're here to talk about optimal work. And specifically, we want to discuss today, to kind of continuing a little theme of how optimal work kind of interacts with other areas of psychology and neuroscience. We did a session a couple of weeks ago on the default mode network. And so, well, I wanted to ask Kevin uh, who his favorite psychiatrist is. Ah, uh, that's, yes, you know exactly who you think I'll say. So, although I have two contenders, uh, so one, of, one is Aaron Beck, so who is one of the developers of, of cognitive behavioral therapy, as we know it today, and I actually got trained by him uh, in the Beck Institute for Cognitive Therapy and Research in Philadelphia. So, uh, super big fan of him. Uh, the, probably, though, I have, to, I have to say now, my, the one I get the most inspiration from is Ian McGilchrist. So, he's a, an Oxford psychiatrist, and I think one of the very best thinkers in psychiatry that we have now. Uh, and he's the one who brings us this idea of bringing back the idea of the difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Okay, so yeah, left left hemisphere, right hemisphere, left brain, right brain. I guess I've heard of that as a kind of outdated theory of neuroscience. I know, uh, everyone thinks it's outdated. It's yeah. not, it's back, it's new. It's, isn't it pseudoscience? <laughs> exactly, well, because they used to think that, well, the left brain did uh, reason and the right brain did emotion. And uh, the left brain liked, I don't know, numbers and the right brain like colors i don't know what all the things were so if you look, if you're a color person then you're right brain uh men were left brain women are right brain there's all these things that they used to say and all that's just total bunk so it, it uh the uh but it's not uh there in fact there are undeniable differences in every single way between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere they're they're asymmetric they have totally they are all involved in the same things but they handle them in different ways, which is totally fascinating. So wait, so like in each cognitive process, they're both doing something or they're both active, they're both contributing, but they're contributing. Yeah, so for instance, ways. in language, if you're talking, you're, the words that you're selecting, so it, it, it are, that's that selection process and choosing the precisely the right word. Well, that idea of precision and abstraction is very left-brained. But the meaning, the deeper meaning of what you're saying, and particularly if you're using humor or metaphors or telling a story, uh, that meaning of it is, is right brain. So in some sense, even when you talk about meaning something that you say, in the left brain, it means choosing the precise word that's right. In the right brain, it means that it's true, that you actually mean it, and that your emotions then, in a sense, resonate it with it. So if, you, if, you, if you're saying, I'm sorry, well, you might say all the right words because your left brain is doing it correctly, but it still doesn't affect the person that you're talking to because they can tell you don't really mean it. It's a perfunctory thing. But whether or not something is perfunctory or heartfelt, that's totally a right brain concept. So the right brain actually is about not just emotions though, but it's also about reality. It's about being. It's about what is true. Uh, it's about ideals. All of those things are right brain concepts. Mm -hmm. It's about beauty, the perception of beauty and goodness. That's all right brain. So the left brain is very technically correct, and it creates models of the world and, uh, and, and logical systems. Um, but the right brain is often what people call their gut instinct. That this, this perception of truth, you know, that's, that's, that's a right brain thing. So he kind of, is he the leading guy bringing this division back? And yeah, so, he has so, a, so is there a major work people can? Yeah, his, his book the, is called The Master and His Emissary. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea is that the, the right brain is meant to be the master and the left brain is meant to be the emissary. And it's based on, 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 a, on a, a classical story, but people can check out Ian McGilchrist. Uh, he's on YouTube, he has lots of great videos. Uh, I don't agree with his philosophy. I think that he, in his education, in, in uh, his uh, very British uh, approach to philosophy, and he's really down on Plato, which is unfortunate. Oh, yeah, because I think Plato is the thinker 
who was most perfectly using both left and right brain approaches, asking the precisely right question, which is kind of left brain, you know, teasing things apart, making distinctions, but ultimately for the sake of ideals and, and for the sake of what kind of life, what's the, what's the most beautiful life that you want to live. So I think that the, if Ian McGilchrist has one problem is that he misunderstands Plato. But his stuff it's is a great. pretty big problem, right? <laughs> it is a problem that actually has a lot of uh, consequences, and yeah. so he is very big on uh, on Heraclitus. Uh, so it, uh, okay. um, but other other than the philosophy stuff, uh, yeah. the science stuff, the neuroscience stuff, and just the human, his understanding of how humans work is is really uh, exceptional. Yeah. Okay. I have a, a question, so maybe we can get a little bit more into the left brain, right brain distinctions. I actually have a couple of questions. Yeah, so you mentioned that the right brain, they, they both have kind of different specialties. So the right brain is about ideals or it's about uh, metaphors or about stories. What does that mean? Does that mean it's, it's better at processing those, those and doing those ways of thinking? or it has those things stored on the right side of the brain or like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand what that means. In the broadest sense, the right brain has the vision of the whole. So it's the whole context. The right brain perceives your whole body. And so if you, uh, if you knock out the left hemisphere, they do this sometimes for epilepsy treatments and they'll, mm -hmm. while they're trying to see where the seizure focus is coming from, they put asleep different parts of the brain. Uh, so if you put the whole left hemisphere to sleep, you're still aware of your entire body because your right brain is always aware of the whole. It's, it's, it's function in some way is to keep you aware of like the forest. Mm -hmm. The left brain focuses on the trees. So if you, uh, if you put the right brain to sleep, so you're only using your left brain, it actually denies the existence of the other half of the body. It's only aware of uh, the way it works is it's aware of the right side. So your left brain controls your right hand, which is where you minutely manipulate the world uh, for most people. And so, but they actually will, if you like show someone their own left hand in this experiment, they deny it's their left hand. Hmm. So they, it's called hemi neglect. And so the, uh, you neglect half of the field of, the, of, of you, but the left brain is like that in everything. It tends to neglect half of everything. So even when it comes to perceiving the world, it's good at seeing structures and machines and mechanisms, but it doesn't see life. It doesn't see things as alive. So it is, which is a funny thing. It doesn't make it seem to be alive or dead. So it can't actually understand anything that is spiritual or immaterial. And so the more people are dominated by the left brain, the more mechanistic and materialistic their thinking tends to be just inherently. So, and that's apart from any philosophical commitments they have. It's just the way the left brain functions. But yet, they can work really well together. And in fact, I mean, whenever you're working at your best, they are working extremely well together. So, sometimes an example I like to use is, or that actually Ian Gilchrist uses, I just copied him, um, <laughs> is what it's like when you're learning a new piece of music. So, like, I know, I know you've played piano and you've, you know, been, yeah. you've learned, and I also play piano. So when you're learning a new piece, piece of music, it could be that you first hear the piece and appreciate its beauty, and that's a right brain thing. The appreciation of the whole of the, the, the piano piece that you're trying to, so it's like Sonata in C, and you, okay, now that's, that's the start. To actually learn how to play it, you have to take it apart and practice the individual runs. So it's not in Stephen Mozart. It has lots of individual runs that your your left and right hand are, are alternating doing, and so and those need to be practiced and practiced and practiced. So and you're focusing more and more not on the whole, but just on getting this right, and getting the precise. And that's actually very much a left brain focus. So it's again it's more on the trees than the forest. Yeah. So you minutely get in and you practice and practice and practice until you get all the parts practiced. But then when you go back to play the whole, now you're affecting it at a much deeper level. You've made a lot of this stuff procedural memory, which is the left brain is great at turning things into procedural memory. It tends to make everything rote. But sometimes that's great, because when you're playing a piece of piano, the more the runs are rote, the more you can then work on the volume, you can work on all these other more subtle things mm -hmm. that are more actually like 
viewing the whole piece you're producing. So, and that's true in any kind of work that you, you, you envision what you're about to do, what you would most want it to be like. But then the taking it apart, breaking it down, arranging the steps, and then focusing on one at a time is also then very much a left brain thing. But yet at the same time, keeping a positive view of the whole, staying entirely in the present moment, uh, and challenging yourself, those are using both hemispheres. You actually, if you put people in an MRI machine and you have them reframe, you would see it's the right ventral medial prefrontal cortex that lights up. You have them practice mindfulness. You'll see it's the right frontal cortex lighting up as they practice mindfulness. So the doorway into flow is very much a right-brained endeavor. Uh, the left brain um, cooperates when you're in flow seamlessly and perfectly with the right, but it seems that, that ha the flow actually has to originate from the right. That's, yeah, so in... in um you know, it's like in, in talking with people, if, if the conversation gets to kind of a, an acute moment or like, uh, okay, maybe there's a kind of emotional thing coming, coming here that you can't like kind of break it down in a systematic way. So you kind of just have to be open to the experience and commit to it. Is, is that a kind of right brain activity where you, you don't know exactly what's going to happen and you can't create a model for it or, you, yeah, I think you when you're to, talking about a conversation, you're saying that this is now a joint work we're doing together. Mm -hmm. And that kind of joint work is done by the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So that the empathy connecting to others, the bond that is, is, uh, is right hemisphere. And a good conversation is, is flow. So you're experiencing flow in that conversation. And so, yeah, I think that you're not going to have perfect control over it. Control is very much a left mm -hmm. brain thing. Yeah. but you are going to be tuned in to the other very deeply. Mm -hmm. So then, so this seems like an extremely important thing that uh, we want to be right brain, so to speak, in the different things that we're engaged in. How do you do that? Exactly. And so I think the, like in the conversation, the more you are um, really connected to the person you're talking to, understanding and listening and taking in what they're saying, um, the more you are using right brain, the more you are trying to get your point across, to get some outcome, you know, to, to like convince them, control them, you know, mm -hmm. that would all be very left brain. So arguments tend to be often incredibly left brain because it's like the meaning of a word. Yeah. What did you mean when you say that, or you said this, or it's, it's like all these like very technical little, and definitely you can see in most arguments, people get focused on things that later seem absurd. But that's what the left brain does. It, get, it, it focuses in on minute issues and it can become completely absurd, you know, that you're having this disagreement over something so insignificant. Yeah. But the left brain doesn't have a sense of significance. It has a sense of technical accuracy and precision. So, which is good for some things, but it's not good for handling people. So, because you, you, you end up then, um, you know, even when you're talking, you're more focused on a topic than on the person. So everything is just about, you know, what's true. There are like very left brain interests and topics. You know, see that, you know, there are people who could, um, they don't really tune in to the person they're talking to. They just have their favorite topics that they're always talking about. You know, and, and that, that's a very left brain approach to conversation. It's not a joint work that you're doing together, but it's like, no, this is my thing I like talking about. And then they become right. super expert on it. Right. I actually just got uh, a couple of days ago, had a very long, or it was way too long about whether Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time, which, you know, is obviously a, a minute and relatively insignificant issue. It also hinges a lot on the meaning of what do you actually mean by the greatest basketball player of all time? Is it possible for there to be one? And then, yeah, you also notice that I'm just trying to get my point across. I'm just trying to win this argument. It's not like a joint. Yeah, and this is a huge, I think this is a super important point that you bring up, but it's that in a, when it comes to how your left and right brains approach work, it, you could say the difference comes down to their use of strategy. So the left brain uses fixed strategies in a rote way. The right brain uses 
is creative in crafting new strategies, ultimately informed by a vision of the whole, by the overall what's best for people, by ideals. Mm -hmm. So the right brain can bring in ideals and shape new strategies because the right brain is always making things new and the left brain is making things old. Now, we need these both together, but you can see what you're talking about in an argument that a fixed strategy would be you just keep saying the same thing and you say it louder and more frequently. Mm-hmm. Yep. But that's, that's a complete exactly fixed strategy. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a complete fixed strategy. And that's, that's how the left brain works. Yeah. The right brain would be thinking, what are, what's another tack I could take? What's another way of this, looking at this? Is there something deeper we could agree on? But, you know, and so you're going to be looking more at the whole and, and to see that, you know, where, where people can come together. But that's, that's that in, I think in any kind of work that we do, in some sense, optimal work is all about getting people to use their right brain in work. Because if you're thinking of this task as an opportunity, you're thinking of it as something new. It's an opportunity for some possibility. And so it's an opportunity for being creative. When you see threats, you're seeing it as something old, as something that you've seen before, the same old thing that you just have to strenuously handle. So reframing already puts you in the right brain view of mind. If you're viewing whatever your current work is as an opportunity for something beautiful, an opportunity for something that will truly serve others, uh, you'll see that that makes it much easier then to settle your mind into that task. And that's what mindfulness does which is another right brain thing. So, and to be just in the present moment. So, and then you can think about once you're kind of all there, how to best engage and challenge yourself to enter the task and get traction and you go into flow, which is again, it's a right brain thing. So now we're talking a lot about strategies. So uh, just the way you, you've described it is that the left brain is thinking in terms of breaking things down and, seeing the part so strategy is kind of like combining the left and right because it's doing the left function of of breaking things down into parts but then it's also with a view to the whole with a view to the goal in mind so strategy is is really the essential connection Mm -hmm. in work between left and right brain that's exactly right strategy is what unites the left and right so the right has the vision of the end and then the left comes up with breaking down the means and it, it breaks them down well. And then you actually uh, unite them when you're engaging the strategy with your full task attention in that first step. And now they're working together. And when they work together, you're in flow. So it's a bigger argument, but um, there are these different axes in the brain, top down, front back, left, right. And flow is when the right top front is in charge. So, and the steps that we use in optimal work in setting up a golden hour are precisely how those three steps get those three parts all in line so that now you're able to fully engage. So yeah, the, the, the left breaks down the strategy, but the right makes it new and keeps it oriented towards the right kind of end. Ultimately, the right is always aiming at the process. It's creative and it's process focused. Uh, and versus the left, which is outcome focused because it, it wants to be tangible. So the process is immaterial in right brain. The outcome is more tangible in left brain. Now, you, we're not going to say you don't want any outcomes in, in work, but it, it depends on like, are you seeking it for its own sake or is this just part of the bigger picture? And so when you're working well with the right brain and flow, your work actually fits into the whole picture of your life. It fits into the whole picture of who you are. It's not tightly compartmentalized and segmented like what the left brain does, but it's always kind of a thriving living whole. That's really cool. Well, I think that's a great note to end on for today. So we'll pick up this topic next week to discuss some of the applications of this left right brain approach to some of the previous topics that we discussed of schemas and service and the whole of life. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks for tuning in.